broadcasting on Star Worldwide Networks. It's Two Small Biz Guys. And now, here are your hosts, Zen Benefiel and Ray Silverstein. We have such a great intro. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, just for a couple old guys. Yeah. Oh, oh, speak for yourself. Yeah, well. It's, I'm, it's not a hey, question. I am a great grandfather now. Oh, you are. Well, I congr- am. Congratulations. Thank I'm you. not even a great grandfather. See? See? And you got 20 years on me. Oh, What's yeah. What's up with that? Well, it just means I'm I'm slow and easy, not yeah. quickie like you. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm down. Um, so last week, we had a really great conversation about 13 fatal mistakes managers make. Actually, we didn't talk about all of them. Uh, We talked about the four main ones, the refusal to accept personal responsibility, the the failure to develop people, the failure to set standards, and the failure to train people. Now, before we get into our next phase of life in the fast lane, we're no eagles. Um, so the, ba- the basics of the book had these foundational concepts about management. It's a skill of obtaining predetermined objectives through and with the voluntary cooperation of others. In other That's words, biggie. leverage up on others. Right. It's kind of like okay. OPM. Okay. Right. The purpose of management is to provide for the continuation of the business, even in our absence. So, in other words, exit strategy, or so you can even take a vacation. Well, so you, your people know <laughs> what they're doing enough for you to trust that you can leave. Well, that's that's part of it. But the aspect is it goes beyond that. Just that they know enough so you can leave, is that they know enough so you can also develop other areas of the business. Right. You've got to be able to create time for you to go build your business. If you are busy doing, 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 and don't develop people. That means that you have to be there all the time. So the key... All work and no play makes Johnny a dull boy. No, it makes Raymond a dull boy and yeah. have no fun, so... <laughs> no fun, Raymond? My, my mother used to say to me, play, 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 and I took her literally. She was, she was talking about I want to play too much, but I thought she said, play more. Well, you know, if, if you're having fun with what you're doing, then it's really not work. Okay, so what's what's the next one? Next one is the generation of profit is mandatory in order for the business to continue, for customers to be served, and for obligations to employees to be met. Next one is people succeed or fail based on their habits. That's right. You know, T. Harv Ecker says, what you do anywhere, you do everywhere. So the aspect is when you get involved in training, which we talked somewhat about last time, is that you have to create new habits for people or so, because we all have habits as to what we do, and we, it makes us we're habitual think creatures, right? Right. It's just H- the ones habitual. that we choose. That's why it's habits. Habitual. Oh, you are so wise. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. People do not try unless two questions can be answered positively: What are my chances of success? And where is the value measured in self-esteem? Well, to me. But all, okay, but it's also measured what's value to me. So the aspect is if I'm going to be uh, successful is this question of self-esteem. Because if I don't succeed, does it, is it a downer for me? So therefore, I don't want to try. But the other aspect is even if I'm successful, does it really mean something for me? If it doesn't mean anything, why should I even bother? Well, you know what? I was listening to Otto Sharmer, who's the facilitator for this MIT class that I'm taking currently. And it's called Leading from the Emerging Future. And he says that one of the concepts for crystallizing and, and producing things is to be able to fail a lot and continue moving on. So it's never, you know, there's this concept of it's uh, 0.8. It's never a 1.0 because your finished product in the first round is never going to be perfect. So it's always a 0.8 where you're striving for more and you're willing to take those risks okay. and you fail early so that you can continue to, to grow. Well, Thomas Edison, when every time when he's trying to like, uh, no, get the light bulb to The 99 function, times? Well, after he failed on number four. I wonder if it was actually 99. No, yeah. I think it was more than that. But the aspect was he said, I I didn't fail. I learned one more thing doesn't work. So now I can try another. But the aspect here is, is that 
Uh, hey, then you got 3M. The Post-it came out of a goof. Well, sometimes. You know, and that's yeah. a big seller for them. Well, sometimes. But, but the aspect is somebody even recognized that the goof was worthwhile. So what does that say about it? That's the key to being observant. Okay, so let's go back to the, all these mandatory things. A manager's job is to induce people to behave properly. Oh, I'm glad you didn't what say the seduce. What is that? I'm glad you said induce instead of in- seduce. seduce. Well, sometimes you can seduce them into behaving properly, too. Oh, okay. it depends what you want to accomplish. Well, oh, when, you're, you're a naughty boy. Those are called company benefits. <laughs> Oh, they are. I oh, I, I thought it was called sexual fringe harassment. Be, fringe, but I, I thought it was called sexual harassment. Well, myself. in some cases, okay. it might be. Um, I'm, I'm always being harassed, um, or him asked, depending. Um, in order to influence the behavior of people, we cannot deal with just behavior. We must deal with people's thinking patterns. Yeah. Now, he's. This is a very interesting thought because he's really talking about the aspect: where is a person? At the time, do they have problems at home? So when you're at work, you just can't say, what is what is the behavior at work? What is the performance at work? Is it, is it a factor? It's a factor of the entire environment. So that's what he's really referring to, is how are they thinking at that time? And I see that he's referring to that, but I also take it a little deeper. You know me, I, I go a little deeper than most. The thinking patterns that we you have. Ought are, a, you ought to be a grave digger. That'd be a perfect job. You know, I dig my own grave a lot. You know, it's insert okay. foot in mouth here. Foot, no, uh, that's right. Foot in so, mouth. Okay, go ahead. But the aspect, okay, what were you going to say? I was going to say that the thinking patterns are often just like the, the habits that we make. And you can tell how people think by how they act. Because right. that's how they show up. Regardless of what they say they think, it's how they show up. And when you can begin to observe those patterns, you understand their thinking process. And it may be self-deprecating, it may be self-sabotaging, and or it may be self-supporting and initiating and someone that you know is always looking at opportunities and possibilities rather than okay. failures and okay. destruction or whatever. Okay, but it also goes into personality assessments. Right. And because the assessment as to how they think drives their personality and drives how they react in circumstances. So, now, yeah, I agree with that. And, and the what, one you liked specifically was managing is thinking, not a doing job. Well, I think it's most interesting because people say, when we discussed this at my meetings last week, and this was probably the most interesting one because people think that managers have a job to perform. But the job to perform is done through a thinking process. And the thinking process is, have I trained someone adequately to do the job? Have we provided the right tools for them to do the job? So it's not just doing, it's really the thinking about what is what is the best way to get the job done. And, and sometimes even managers will <laughs> have that opportunity to train their replacements and have that kind of attitude where they're not frightened that somebody's going to take over their job, which is another thinking process that we don't really know until there's a situation that takes place where you can see that through yeah. the observed behavior. Well, I think I told you, but I had a fellow in one of my groups who used to be, before he started his own company, he used to be the vice president in charge of quality control for Nabisco. And if you remember way back Ooh, when, when they, talked about, when they talked about the barbarians at the gate who was taking over Nabisco, okay. he was- Are one, those the ones with the skewers? Well, that's right, they, they skew you. But the interesting part was that uh, I asked him how to become how to become a head of quality control for Nabisco, and he said he always hired somebody better than him, because otherwise he could not get promoted because nobody was there to do his job and they would keep him at that level. And a lot of people in business are afraid to hire somebody better than them. There's a gentleman in Chicago who's very much but into that was my point earlier. Okay, but there's also a fellow in Chicago who's into very much into technology. I can't think of Howard Tuckman, and he basically says that a lot of people hire someone who's 80% as good as they are. So if you think about it, the first person hires someone who's 80%, the second person they hire is 80%. So, we're now so now you to, dropped 40. We're down to 64%. Right. The next person hires someone who's 80%. We're now down to 48%. So how does that organization really grow and prosper when, you're, when your people down there are 64% or 48% as good as the people up on top. Well, that goes you to don't. that 
or the 60, 60, 60, 60, 20, 60, 20, rule. 20, 60, 20 rule that, that you espouse. And, and that is that, you know, how you treat that 60 percent is going to determine where the other 20 are, the upper and lower. Right. That, well, in a nutshell. Yeah. You know, OK, we didn't we weren't. This wasn't on our list, but it's also is anything one of the rules. No, it's uh, we're listless. <laughs> we are so listless. So, so is, is, that, is there really a we're listless when we say we can't find yeah. it? We're listless. Well, at least we're not lispy. Oh, okay. So, one of the one of the things he talks about is oh, error, fatal error number twelve, recognizing only top performers, in which is kind of an interesting aspect because a lot of businesses you get someone who's a great salesman. You went off producer. script on that one. You I know. know. Well, I just want to see if you're paying attention. See how you are. <laughs> so, okay. but the aspect with that is it's very interesting because we you know you talked about all you know, the. 20, oh, the 20, 60, 20, 20. Yeah, this falls into that, okay. right? So the 20 percent of your people are very great good, segue. and those people you recognize all the time. 60 percent are okay, but they're really the, they're really the people who are producing for you. They are in maybe in the trenches is the wrong term, but they're there day in and day out for you, and they're the people that a lot of managers show up on time, give it their all, and but a lot of managers overlook them, and he's talking about that. This is a major error because. Uh, they don't feel respectful. They don't feel. They don't feel that you identify with them, recognize them. So he talks about that people should identify the people who are in that sixty percent, the ones who are, no, not the top performers. The bottom performers always get recognized because you say. So with no your tool company, good. right? Okay, with your tool company, company, you had what thirteen hundred employees, something like that. How did you apply this rule to that? Well, the interesting part is a lot of well. We we applied it, but we didn't always apply it. I mean, the great producers we always worked. Well, with. you were still young then, and and you and know, learning the the I, ropes I was, too. I was, I was impressionable. So. Yes, you were. So, so the aspect with that time was we we you tried to recognize the people. Now, the also we, we were involved in union environments, and union environment uh, is somewhat different because the union tries to make all people equal within the workforce. Right. And management tries to get people to be people to rise and above don't do the, anything out of your classification. Well, not about the classification. Don't do it above the the quality that's expected. And uh, so it becomes somewhat. There's some people who want to do it better, and some people want to do it faster. So the aspect is those people you'd want to work with. So it's it's a little bit well, different. That aspect. would only be logical, but you know the the union philosophy seems a little counterintuitive uh, well, from that perspective. Well, okay, but the aspect here is is that I think the interesting part is that a lot of people don't recognize or think about the normal people within the workforce, that they ought to be respected, they ought to you know, be recognized, and because they are doing the job day in and day out, and if they didn't do the job, you couldn't be in business. Well, how, how were some of the things that you think would be best for them to be recognized? What would have the most impact? Well, the most impact is, is recognition and just re showing respect that, no, Zen, we're glad you're here. You do a good job. We appreciate the job that you do. I mean, you don't have to go out with prices. You don't have to go out. Well, money doesn't matter in those kind of case, cases. Money doesn't motivate. It's the accolades. It's the treatment, like you're saying. It's the recognition that one gets for the job that they're doing that makes them feel okay. like they want to do the job. Okay, but the biggest problem with this is is that they don't re get recognized one way or the other. They're right. just there. And so I think you have to do something to make show that they're not just there. Now, for example, when uh, all the employees that we had, I when I used to go visit our plants, the first thing I would do is walk around and say hello to every employee in, on the workshop. Mm -hmm. So that took a, a long time. I also sent birthday cards to every person. Well, you were young. You had the time. Yeah, right. So he had, I still sent birthday cards to every employee. And if I knew more about them, I'd write a personal note on it other than just a happy birthday. Uh, in other words, if somebody was graduating from school, I'd make a notation about that. If I knew that they're, uh, that they like gardening, I'd so make you're a notation a, about that. So you're of the management by walking around philosophy. The MBWO, yes, right. Management by walking around, right. Well, and that's been proven over the years to be one of the most effective ways of managing because when your face is shown people know you there's more of a authentic sense that you're actually there you're with them you're part of their lives they're part of your life rather than some separative notion that you know you're in a tower somewhere commanding <clears throat> 
your troops to go to war or whatever okay. that that may be well but you have war be, being you know okay. to to garner market share okay but you have to be careful in that respect that you don't uh torpedo or cut the legs out of the manager that the person reports to so if you find a fault or a problem you have to you know go on the side get the manager and talk to the manager about your observation and let them remedy it. Well, that's all part of the communication plan that you develop for handling those types of things. And hopefully you have one that's built into your business plan. Right. Okay, let's go back to what you talked about, the foundation concepts. And you said that number three, the generation of profit is mandatory in order for the business to continue. Yeah. Now he talks about one of the errors is a lot of managers forget to talk about the importance of profit. And a lot of people think profit is a dirty word. And the aspect is that a lot of people don't fully recognize that if the business doesn't make a profit, they can't pay the employees, they can't stay in business, there's going to be out of business. That so sounds rather prophetic. Well, but the aspect is a lot of people... Not pathetic, but prophetic. Yeah, right. But a lot of... To some it might be pathetic. Well, it, it could be, but the aspect is you want that to be profitable. Absolutely. So, so the aspect here is how do you, how do you profitable talk? and proselytizing. So how do you talk? How do you talk to the employee group, and emphasize the profitability of the organization and how important it is to the organization and to them? Well, for one of the things I, I experienced it in my years in the aerospace industry, you know, when you give it your all, when you're looking to improve, and the company is always. You know, they're, they're asking for suggestions as to how to improve jobs, working conditions, machine, you know, cycle times and things like that. So when you're looking for those types of things, you've automatically raised the bar because you're doing the kinds of things that continue that momentum towards doing the best you can, which ultimately makes a product less expensive and more profit goes into the company because you're spending less time manufacturing and doing all the things that are necessary to put the product into the market. And then you can not only provide more for your employees in the community, you're also increasing the, the bottom line on your P&L. Yeah, but the aspect is that you have to, you have to remind people that your the business is really in a business to make a profit. They also want to make a, maybe a contribution to the community. Mm -hmm. But if they don't make a profit, they can't fulfill all these other desires, goals, and... Uh, yeah, if a company's not profitable, everybody's going to lose. You're yes. not going to be there very long. That's right. That's right. You're not going to You're not going to be now, there. Now, that's prophetic. No, that's being a has-been is what <laughs> it is. And nobody likes being a has-been. Not at all. Okay. However, in the process of that, what are some of the things that you think are, are most profitable in getting the employees or, or um, having that communication delivered throughout the workforce? Okay, I think that takes us really back to my other number five, uh, and that is... The he likes to repeat himself. I know. Well, Pete and repeat were on a boat, and Pete fell in. Who was left? Three Pete. No, oh, three Pete, right. So... The, the aspect is no, Pete. You, you don't want to manage everyone the same way because when, when you try to manage everyone the same way, you're not successful because you're not appealing to that individual. You don't right. We're not automatons. In their language. We have to be recognized. It's like coming to the table uh, in any kind of negotiation or mediation or anything like that. When you're dealing with people and problems within the plant or facility, whatever it might be, organization, everybody has their own dictionary. So you better understand what the other person's dictionary is, the language that they have, the words that are triggers for them, and all those kinds of things. If you are going to have any kind of listening right, you from have, the other party. Right. You have to talk in their language. Right. Which means you have to talk in their style, and you have to talk as to what is what are their beliefs. You have to talk about, you mentioned thinking before, you have to talk about how they're thinking, what is the environment that they're involved with. Yeah, in so, sales, we call it mirroring, but it, it, it's much deeper than that. It's much more important. Well, in sales, they talk about the aspect that, you no, know, it's sales was kind of... Emulating, I guess it is. Well, it was kind of 
they talk about the was God God created because you're created with two ears and only one mouth. So in sales, they want listen you to more, listen speak more. Less. Right. right. So management is also the same way that you listen more and you speak less and you but you really want to understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. So you can there's a third filter there. What's the third filter? That's your heart. Oh, because okay. people are emotional. They're going to feel how you're communicating with them, regardless of what you, you know, what you're attempting to express. They're going to use that dictionary. They're going to hear it. They're going to internalize it, and they're going to respond from that plate, that internal emotional place. In most cases, even though they're doing their best to keep it in a little in an intellectual conversation. So this author says, uh, "Know your employees as well as you know your family." and do the thing that works to motivate each individual. Now, it's kind of interesting because to know them that well, it also means that you have to be very careful you don't become their uh, psychologist, that you don't become their financial advisor. There's, there's this very narrow line that you don't want to cross as to where you become more than just a a manager to them. There's been an acceleration in that process today, and we call those people that bridge that gap effectively coaches. Well, coaches don't bridge the gap. Coaches basically are, they're, they're, they understand what the gap is. Poor choice is. of words. Yeah, yeah. well, they, they leave the, the other behind, and this is the bridge that I'm talking about. You know, it's like the. Are you talking, now again, you're talking about behind. So. Okay, so you get in front of okay. this momentum, okay, and you nurture people by coaching them along, not necessarily paying attention to all their trials and tribulations and things of that nature, which a counselor or therapist or whatever you were talking about earlier would tend to do, because then that gets you into their emotional uh, environment. And that's not where you really want to be. You want to be able to see them for who they are, coach them to where you know they can be. That's right. One for you. Ta -da. <laughs> so ding 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 ding. So when they talk about like a football coach, by now and see the, the football coach cannot play the game. The football coach is on the sidelines, and all the football coaches can create the strategy. Business creates the strategy. The football coach selects the best talent managers select the best talent to perform the job mm -hmm. uh, they put the players on the field and the people really so they're they're whispering on the side i i think we're probably running over time yeah we are we're going to take a break here real quick and uh just because I mean, we're thinking it's about half it it's half time it's well it's a quarter time but it's more like a third time today okay so we'll be right back with you thanks for listening to two small biz guys two small biz guys with zen and ray we'll be back after this if you're like me a small business owner not only do the guys make business discussions more enjoyable, they also share a lot of information on their website, twosmallbizguys.com. They've got free downloads from Crib Notes on best-selling business books, two worksheets that help you run your business more effectively. Make sure you take a look. You'll be glad you did. That's the number two, smallbizguys.com. As a business owner, have you ever felt alone at the top? You don't have to be. Ray Silverstein has worked with many business owners for over 20 years facilitating peer advisory boards. He is the proverbial mentor and tormentor. A pro president's peer advisory board is a confidential monthly meeting of non-competitive owners that give support, feedback, and knowledge. They know the adage, all of us are smarter than one of us. He has walked in your shoes, having owned and sold two companies with sales in excess of $60 million and approximately 1,300 employees. In Young President's organization, he participated in peer advisory boards and felt it was a key to his success. His passion is to help small business owners succeed. He knows peer boards work when you are open, don't feel like you know it all, are willing to put issues on the table, and willing to take criticism. Be his guest at a pro advisory board meeting to see if it works for you. There's no commitment to join, and you'll have a great experience. To sample a free pro business owner peer board, email ray at proprez.com. That's ray at proprez.com. There's no commitment or charge. You're 
listening to Two Small Biz Guys. Now, back to your hosts, Zen Benefield and Ray Silverstein. And we're breaking habits as we speak today. No, we're creating new habits. Yeah, so, we're, we're, we're thinking out, uh, we're acting outside the box. Okay, we'll do Even that. Even though we're in a box. I'm not going to say anything about that. You know, it's easier to read labels it is when what? you're outside the box. It is. Yeah. Then you know what's inside of it. And you know whether you want to get the box or not. Happy in this. All right. So speaking oh. of being inside the boxes, we are also on Apple iTunes. And there is a link on our website. It is the number two, smallbizbizguys.com. And you'll notice that there is a link uh, at the top of the page for law and demand versions of the show. And it'll take you directly to iTunes, where we have uh, a number of shows up there already. Right. And also, we have on our website, the number two, smallbizguys.com, where there's a lot of good freebie stuff that you can download. Yeah. 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 Many of our shows have, uh, especially, you know, this, uh, like the book that we're doing today, you've been kind and gracious and, and done your homework and written some crib notes for them. So you've condensed the book. Uh, into a crib note form so that you can glean the most opportuni opportunistic pieces of the puzzle right, for you yourself. Can, you can read it very quickly, right? Yeah. So if you go to two small biz guys, you Dot can get, com. All, get all this good stuff. You can. So we were talking about we were some errors that managers make. And one of the ones he talks about is people, managers, concentrate on problems rather than the objective. And I found that rather interesting because a lot of people, when they go to work, they're so concerned about the problem that they are studying, studying, studying the problem. And therefore, they never really think about the objective. And the, and the key really is to, you want to you want to win the war, not just the battle. Right. So, so the aspect is you just, if you have a problem, but if it takes you away from achieving the objective, you're really, you're really concentrating on the wrong thing. Well, it's like a critical path. And those, you know, what whatever kind of software you use for your scheduling, you have multiple layers, you have uh, contingencies within it, you have contiguous efforts, and you have simultaneous efforts. So all of these things may have a controller in them, which determines the flow of that overall schedule. So in, if a problem comes up that impedes that, that critical schedule path, which is going to throw off your timed delivery. You know, these are things that we learn as we develop business because everything takes time. When you learn how to schedule that, then as a planner, as a scheduler, as a strategist, you can build those into an overall scheme and know how you can promise and deliver by you know, certain dates, right? It, that sounds very intellectual, yes. And, but the aspect is to really boil it down. It's very what, practical. When you, have a, when you have a critical path, the critical, first of all, a lot of listeners may not know what the critical path means, but if you have a project from A to Z, the critical path are those items that if you, you can't move beyond that item until it's completed. Those are controllers. Those are your controllers. But the aspect is, in being a manager, your management... Your, your management capability is to achieve the, the goals or objectives of that activity. And when you have a problem, sometimes that problem will... On time, at or below budget. Uh, well, I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking <laughs> about getting the damn thing done. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm very simplistic in my management style. Just get it done. Personality style, get it done. Yeah, so the aspect is D. So the aspect is you have to get the objective and not get side... Not put all your effort and time no into just intended. working on the problem. <laughs> right. Punishment. So, uh, so he talks about, he says, management is essentially a thinking, not a doing job. So when you get involved in working on the problems, you're busy doing, not thinking. And the aspect is, how do you think your way around the problem to get to the, to get to the objective and get it done? So, that's the critical so, question so, at that point. So that's what the management really has to think about. Are there other alternatives to the solution? And maybe the problem is really an opportunity to create a new process, 
uh, to well, really yeah, move, let's move look at forward. how a manager would do that. What what's the thinking process, and does he do it on his own? Does he engage others that know more than him about the product, service, production line, whatever it is that the problem exists in? Right, because all he knows is there there's a problem. Well, I would think you. you well, I'm just a monitor. And, and, but you you would no. you would operate with the within the environment that you're in. If you have another pr person that has a problem or was, has this problem, it also comes back to the aspect of when people bring you problems as a manager. It's, I call it the bag of rocks theory. They're, they carry a bag of rock. They carry a rock to you, and they say, "Zen, I have a problem." And since you're so anxious to solve my problem, you take my rock from me, and I go merely on my way, and I leave the problem with you. So what happens is, is I and you unburden I, yourself. I've unburdened myself. Oh, very good. So what I'm, I'm really managing you, rather than you managing me. Mm -hmm. So the aspect is, you have to come back to me and say, okay, you know, Ray, let's think about how you might resolve this issue. What are some of the? You have to take more time to maybe train me, to educate me, to work with me as to how to resolve it. Do you come back or do you take that moment of opportunity? Um, you know, in education, we call them teachable moments where there's an opening for someone to listen. So they're getting ready to hand you their problem. And then what do you do? Do you say, well, no, wait a minute. Okay, so let's make sure we understand this problem and ask them a series of questions to, so that you get a better view of it. Then how do you engage them more by asking uh, at least for me i would think that you learn how to ask better questions of the problem to help them work toward a solution rather than handing it off to you well when, well rather than giving them the answer this goes back to right. the, the aspect right. of you training. get them to figure out the answer on their own yeah when you give them the answer you really are taking away their ability to be developed Right. And, and part of the part of the aspect of of developing people is to give them the thinking process, and to make them think about it. And how many businesses do you know of, or have you been in, that uh, you as the global you here, you listening audience, how many times have you known someone in your environment that was a go-to person? Any questions you have, you could go to them and ask them, and they would freely give you the information. Well, they think, well, the aspect is they think they're doing a a favor for the organization, but they really aren't. Sure. Now, the question is, why Why well, do they do that? Now, you also get involved when you have something with time constraints. So, you no, know, to make people think and to ask these questions takes more time. But if there's a time constraint, sometimes people will just say, here's what you have to do. You know, just go to do it. it done. Right. Because, and that's understandable in some situations when you have a critical path that is uh, critical, uh, super critical. So you got a deadline you're coming up on. You don't have time to, to do the training and development. You just got to get the part done and out the door. So all, so all these aspects take a question of judgment. And judgment is an aspect of, aspect of thinking. Easy for you to say. Well, sometimes I might get tongue-tied. but. Right. Uh, so we only have that. We only want to have slip knots for when I get tongue tied. That's the lisping. Lisp, lisping? Yes. No, we're, we're, we're not. We're not whispering the solution. We're saying that you have to get people to solve their own problems and to work with them. Absolutely, and you give them the opportunity to grow on their own. Whereas instead of giving them the answer, you know, you tell them where to look, not what to see. So when, it's kind when, of the, the so old adage, they, right? I have a question. When they grow on their own. I have one question. When they grow on their own, does that mean they're gruesome? They have gruesome. Well, <laughs> just ask me a question. Yeah, ask me a question. That, that's 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 the question of the day. I'm ready for a break on that one. <laughs> and we thank you for listening to Two Small Biz Guys. We hope you enjoy our banter, and we'll be back to banter some more in just a few moments. Two Small Biz Guys with Zen and Ray. We'll be back after this. Hi, I'm Zen Benefield with Be The Dream Transformational Life Coaching and Professional Services at BeTheDream.com. Our mission? To provide leading-edge transformational personal and business development services. Our services include life coaching, enterprise coaching, partnering facilitations, and possibilities coagulating. We've been in business since 1988. 
In times of massive change, you need someone who can help you adjust and transform. I can meet that challenge with you, offering a stellar skill set from serving individuals and companies for over 20 years. I invite you to peruse BeTheDream.com and put me to the test. Fill out the coaching assessment survey and give me a call. The first call is free and you can find out if I'm what you are looking for in a coach, consultant, or service provider. Call 480-633-7179. Let your dreams mold future realities. Be the dream. Business owners want to call their own shots, make appropriate income, and control their destiny. Our passion is to help you achieve your goals. A ProPure Advisory Board is just the thing. It's a confidential monthly meeting of non-competitive owners facilitated by a pro who has walked in your shoes. He's your mentor and tormentor moving you ahead. When you have issues or opportunities keeping you awake, where do you get help? Pro Boards give support and non-biased feedback from your peers. To sample a free Pro President's board meeting, email ray at propres.com. There's no commitment or charge. Email ray at propres.com. You're listening to Two Small Biz Guys. Now, back to your hosts... Zen Benefield and Ray Silverstein. All right. I'm glad you're still with us, Ray. So am I. At least you are. <laughs> if I'm not here, i got to be someplace else. I know. And if I'm but, someplace else, I can't be here. Yeah, right? yeah, that sounds rather incompetent. It sounds like Abbott and Costello. But yeah, well, okay. for, the, for those of you who hey, remember I- Abbott... All okay. right, so we're going to talk about uh, fatal error number eleven. Oh, okay, that's that's a very interesting one. It it is, and, and so you want to condone incompetence. You don't want to, right? Well, the aspect is, what, what is incompetence? What is incompetence? Uh, well, I think incompetent. Well, we got to be very careful with this word. What is being not in- incontinence? Okay. This is incompetence. Okay. I know we're is, old, okay, okay, but we're not that old. The aspect is when you get an employee that you've trained, that you've worked with, and they can't get the job done, the aspect is that they might be more competent in some other position or maybe not even within the company. And the question I always ask people is that if you look at your worst employee and if they perform at a level below expectation, you promote them. Well, you could do that, but but the aspect is. Do you what remember if, the Peter principle? Yeah, I remember speaking the of Peter. repeat and three beat. Yeah, well, I remember the Peter principle. So a lot of people, a lot of people work up to their level of incompetence, which is the Peter principle. But the aspect is when you have an employee who really is incompetent, what does it say about you if you continue to keep them on the payroll? And especially in small or in that position. A well, lot we of, kind of fall into the traps, according to the author, for, for one of three reasons. And, and here's what he says about that. Okay. Because we feel the need to be loved and seek it in the office. Now, we really only have two driving features in life. That's to love and be loved. So we've got to be careful with that and where and how we show that. Second one is because we hope the problem will disappear if we ignore it. Can't see it. It's not there. Right. Yeah. Because we lack the willingness or ability to confront others. Now, I think that's a biggie because nobody likes to confront people. Very few do. Yeah, there's a true. there's an art and science to yeah. that, I believe. Okay, but uh, that's true. Like a lot of people don't want to be get involved in a confrontation. But I think there's a fourth reason which he doesn't really cite. And the fourth reason is from the experience I've had in observing people is they just don't want to do it because it, they feel it's going to take them away from their job or doing by having to hire somebody else. And they say uh, a known is better than an unknown. And I, I don't condone that. My, my feeling is if the known is That's not... That kind of so, sounds like a dysfunctional yeah. relationship. Well, okay, but we're talking about people. And, if, and they're all relationships. Okay. okay, but my aspect is if the... If the person is not performing at an acceptable level, you have to make a change because otherwise, what it does, it pulls down the morale of you the go entire back to organization. The 20 rule. Yeah, we're back to that. 
So the aspect is, so therefore, if you are too lazy or fearful of wanting to make the change, because a lot of people say, okay, my job is in sales or my job is in production, so I'm busy doing the job. And if I have to look for another person that takes me from my perception of what my job is. And so if I say my job is to really to put in the best people in the job, to train them, to give them the education to move forward. So I don't have to be involved on, on, a, no, on a very close basis. Uh, that's really what my job is. So it goes back to this aspect of what is really the, uh, what is really the objective rather than the problem. So you have to remedy that employee that really is not you know, holding up their, bar, their part of the bargain. And as an owner, if you have a manager that's not able or willing to perform to that level, then you've also got to consider, okay, what do I do with this person? How do I move them to a place that's more effective for them okay. as well as take care of these okay, other issues. Okay, so the first question would be with that manager. Does that manager really work with that individual to train them, to give them the education so they aren't a poor performer? Mm -hmm. And if they still are a poor performer, then why hasn't the manager made a change? And if the manager hasn't made a change, what does that say about the manager? It means that manager is not really a good manager for you. Right. And you have to make that change. So the aspect is... Are you willing to accept and condone incompetence? And that's, so I think that's really when you have an organization that doesn't perform above standard. And the standard can be very measurable or maybe it's a, a very obje uh, subjective type of criteria. But the aspect is... I, I think it goes both ways. I, I think there's metrics that can be used to determine performance, you know, productivity um, time standards, those, those kinds of things. Then you've also got the observable, which is the social scene within the organization. How well people are getting along. Are there personality conflicts? And are those personality conflicts between employees and manager, or employee employee, or manager manager? Yeah, you, you get involved a lot of times where employees come to you and say, I don't get along with Sally, or Sally doesn't get along with us. And you get involved in this whole uh, society type of problems. Right. And there's yeah. a percentage of those that are self-revealing. When they come to complain, it's usually them that are, that, that are the problem rather than the solution. And the solution might be that they need to leave. Oftentimes, though, it, or at least the uh, management philosophy that's growing is that you have the, per and this is one of the things, the personal responsibility and accountability for who and, and what you are, how you show up for your daily activities in the workplace. Okay, they, they also get involved in the aspect of how you communicate to the employee that are not performing the job. And a lot of people uh, use the uh, great job but philosophy. Right. Uh, they don't want to, they don't want to just say, you know, Zen, you're really screwed up or Zen, we have to really work on improving the performance in this area. They want to say, you know, you, normally you do a good job, but, right. and when you use that format, I, I think it's a negative format because when you use that, the person is always waiting for the but, even when you're giving a positive comment. Sure. So, now, would you say that the one minute manager, which a lot of, of you know, business folks are, are aware of, it's kind of an old school, I mean, it, it's been around for a long time that you praise, you look at what they could improve on, and then you tell them how to improve it, right? Or, or you, you look at their great things, their lesser things, and what they need to, to do to improve. Well, the one-minute manager format is that you want to give, you want to give positive information first, uh, more so than negative information. Right. And what you want to do is when you have positive information, you make it positive. And when you have negative information, you make it positive. Negative. Oh. No, I mean, but you, <laughs> but okay. So you try to do it in a positive format. Right. Now, generally, people will start off and say, okay, there's a problem here. Let's discuss how we can resolve, how you, we or you can resolve this problem or this issue. And then it gets to the point where they're saying, no, we must, you, you just have to resolve this. And then yeah, you were very point. creative in how you set that machine up wrong, but let's see if we can do it a little <laughs> bit better. 
in the next time so that you actually produce yeah. good parts, yeah, right? Yeah, the nice. Yeah, you 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 do a great job producing scrap. I mean, that's really nice. I mean, yeah, our, our scrap dealer loves you. In fact, they want to give you a bonus. So, so <laughs> it's yes, I, I I agree that they you have to com uh, communicate to them how to do a better job. But sometimes the aspect is that you really get you no know, PO'd about it, then you really don't step back and you just want to reprimand rather than give them the education. But and, there are and times. And that's where that pause button but times, is but, essential. Well, yeah, but there are times when it has to be a reprimand. Oh, I, I, I don't disagree with that because actions have consequences. We all know that. Sometimes we don't want to believe it, but when it comes back, to our behavior producing those consequences, then we need to fess up and, and make the appropriate changes in order so that it doesn't happen again. Right. So you want consequences. That's, so you you want to you want the consequence to achieve a a positive performance in the future. Right. You don't want to you don't want to have a consequence that causes your employee to want to um, take revenge. Revenge. Why would an employee want to take revenge? Yeah, sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, they don't like it that they've been exposed. Well, right? Yeah. They Maybe they think they've gotten away with things and all of a sudden they're called on the carpet for it and they're like, well, that dirty rotten, how dare them call me out like that. But um, I th I, okay, Especially but if it's done several times privately and it still continues, and you have to call them out in a more public environment. Well, I, I think you have to. I think you have to take people on privately and talk to them. Oh, I agree uh, that that's a, and, the best way to handle it, uh, at least initially. But what happens if they don't listen, and they're an integral re uh, employee, and you're unable to replace them immediately? Well, what do you do? What do you do? Uh, I think that you mean number two. Well, what do you do? I, I think when you have an employee and they don't perform, or they don't, or they don't uh, participate in the culture of the organization, you start immediately looking for the replacement, because if you if you can't get them on the same page, first of all, you made a bad hire, or the person has gone through personal trauma, and you and then you want to find out what that problem is, but. The aspect is, if the person is integral and they are not on the same page with you, you're going to have a major problem and you have to make that replacement. Right. And, and you have to consider, you know, how many layers of the onion are you willing to peel back in order to help them get through things if they're that valuable an employee? Or is it something that you're just not going to be able to do anything about and you have to support them from apart from afar yeah instead that's right yeah well or a bar depending <laughs> well you say approach you say help them from a bar right is that what you said okay i'll drink to that pony but, up to uh-huh uh, is that right hand or left handed i mean uh, it depends on the stein oh uh, silver silver right oh okay we gotta be very careful with this <laughs> so in in all of this it, it really uh, it, it appears anyway to boil down to really like you said before a manager's job is thinking about the environment it's about the strategy that's necessary in order to make the most productive <coughs> work environment that you can make right right so I, I think you know if you want to boil it down is that people get so involved in doing they think that doing is a job and really thinking is a job and you have to get away from just being the doer and step back and say, what do, I, what do we really have to accomplish? How do we accomplish it? Do we have the right people to accomplish it? Have, have we given them the right training and the right tools? So it really becomes a thinking process rather than just a doing process. And speaking of tools, you will find a number of really good tools in the forms of downloads, uh, white papers, worksheets, and things of, of that nature throughout the various shows we've done before and at practicalbizu.com, which also has a whole slew of uh, small business curriculum available there. So go check those out. Check out our website. Share. You know, we're, we're all over the social networks and you know, if you like the show and like what we've got to offer, 
please share it. That's how we grow, and we all benefit that way. Right, and you, and if it's, if it was chess, you could even say checkmate because you want to work and check it out with your friend. Yeah, great, mate. You know, hey, we do have some followers down in Australia too, and, and that's really good. We're making waves. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Speaking of making waves, we're going to uh, float out of here. And, you know, uh, we're all on a relationship on the ocean of emotion looking for safe harbor. We hope you found one today. Thanks for listening to Two Small Biz Guys, and we'll be back with you next week. Oh, I'm overwhelmed with that last one. Yeah. <laughs> See you later. Two Small Biz Guys with Zen and Ray. Back after this. Business owners want to call their own shots, make appropriate income, and control their destiny. Our passion is to help you achieve your goals. A Pro Peer Advisory Board is just the thing. It's a confidential monthly meeting of non competitive owners facilitated by a pro who has walked in your shoes. He's your mentor and tormentor, moving you ahead. When you have issues or opportunities keeping you awake, where do you get help? Pro Boards give support and non-biased feedback from your peers. To sample a free Pro President's board meeting, email ray at propres.com. There's no commitment or charge. Email ray at propres.com. The digital world is vast. Is it working for you? Would you like some qualified help? Zen Benefiel is a wonder with social media who leads focused and organized workshops on multiple platforms like Facebook, Google Plus, and LinkedIn. He leads by example, not theory, and teaches you how to live large and lively on the web. From blogs to SEO, his web presence speaks for itself. Take advantage of his expertise. Visit BeTheDream.com and click on Web Wizardry. Hire him while you can. You're listening to Two Small Biz Guys. Now, back to your hosts, Zen Benefiel and Ray Silverstein. Well, as an old guy, I got ahead of myself and uh, closed the show a little early. So we're going to come back well, and, we and talk a little bit more. So I was thought we were in the same place. So. Uh, we're in the same place, but just different time. That's why you keep me around. Yeah. <laughs> and that's our lovely host and or producer, Wendy West. And uh, she's been enjoying our bantering today and was so good. And I just lost track of things. It's what happens when you have that in the studio. It's a timeless environment, a timeless it episode. It really is. So back to topic and and thanks for sticking with us even though we closed this out you know this is what happens in uh management right you think you're done with something all of a sudden it comes back well the, well technically you're never really done with something because the aspect is you can always do something better you can always produce something more so you never really are done with it. Things don't come always come to an end. Unless you're working on like in a construction project where you build it and you move on. Right. But in, well then you still have your maintenance contracts to, to upkeep it. Okay. But within but within a an organization and you're working on developing people, there is really never an end to development. No, there isn't. So you always want to enhance and be also because there's new skill sets, there's new technology that comes down the pike. Uh, there's all these new things and the, the and there's the, always better ways to manipulate your employees uh, manipulate that was the <laughs> word you're gonna pick up on yeah so the interesting aspect is the word is people talk about motivation so what is the difference between motivation and manipulation one is a positive term and one is a negative inference it is and you use the the correct term there the inference um, the positive side of things is the motivation. Now, how you do that, motivation is always an internal job. So you provide the opportunities, you provide the, the environment, the encouragement, the relationships that nurture that internal motivation that one would have toward their best production. Okay, so I think it simply comes down to both uh, recognition and respect. So, because otherwise, the, 
you try to use all other tools and it's also knowing the person as to what type of activities are really going to be a motivator for them sure uh, I remember we had a, a, a circumstance in one of the groups where someone wanted to give them like a four or five thousand dollar bonus and that really didn't mean that much to that individual and then he came back the person was a very much a golf addict and he said, well, we'll pay for you and your buddy or family to go to Pebble Beach for a week to play golf. Ooh, wow. And that was what, okay, that, that would was work a for me. Okay, so that was a very big thing for them. That was a much big motivator for them because the money, because they could, the money that they could have gotten would have done the same thing. But it, they, Yeah, they could have gone to Pebble Beach with the money, but... but, but but they didn't perceive it as that way. Cause but then they'd have to make the choices and the plans and, and all of that, so it would be more on them no, than the company. No, but the, but the aspect was that the company recognized what was important to them. Right. And that would became the motivation, what's important to that individual. So when you try to motivate someone, you try to make it for, you want to make something that is important to that individual, whatever they like, rather than just something in general. So one of the benefits of small business is that small business can treat people a little bit uniquely and differently than they can in large companies. True. Be because there are the policies are you know, have to be very uniform across all, all strata. So the aspect is what will really motivate an individual? What really turns them on? What is their hot button? And also, many times, something as a gift or whatever. Hang on a second uh, while I go check the personnel file. Oh, you're gonna, oh, you're gonna check it. You're being very personal. Yes. <laughs> I guess that's how you do it. You'd be very personal to, you know, what's really well, and, and, and where would you, you know, as a manager, would you want to store those things in your head or have them in a file somewhere in case you're not there or others need to look? You know, how do you, you know, and, and what's the legalities of keeping that kind of information about your employees? Is there such? I don't know. You know? I don't know. I, uh, I, I would imagine there's no problem because you were saying these are not negative things. You're not making them public. I wouldn't uh, think so unless you had a data breach and all of a sudden it was on WikiLeaks. Well, that's fine. Then, we, then the world will know. The world will know I'm a chocoholic. They'll send me chance, no, they'll send me chocolate to sample. Sure. What a deal. Yeah, such a Boy. deal. Yeah. Such and a I think deal. I, I think it's, we're going to let this out. World, world, no! Send me chocolate, dark well, chocolate. Would it would it be great if things were that transparent? You know, we often hide those things that are most important to us, especially in the workplace initially, because we don't necessarily want to get close to others around us, because then we might have to care. Okay, but that's why this author says, no. To, in order to manage the people, you have to get to know them like your own family. And to, when you get to know caring them, caring is sharing. Yeah, when you get to know them, you get to know what is their hot button, and what really, really is important to them, and so it's, it's beneficial in that respect. Well, and today I think that's all uh, so important in the development of relationships on that ocean of emotion, because we truly are seeking safe harbor in every environment that we're, that we're with unless we're prone to you know enjoy chaos and and being able to step into those places and, and those kind of folks are few and far between even though there are those that love the challenge the majority of the people don't like confrontation they want to get along <clears throat> they want to do a good job some of them may even want to do an excellent job and the more you can motivate them rather than manipulate them from their perspective, the better performance you'll get from them. I agree. But also in the environment today, uh, more jobs are less, you don't have very many production type, production line type jobs. So you have a lot of service type jobs where these- Well, it's still of, production, it's just a different- Well, but the aspect is it's not as measurable. The, measure, the measuring aspects are more subjective rather than objective. So when you have people who are the functioning that, yeah. in these type of subjective type jobs, it's really more of what their personal belief is as to how high they're going to perform. So you have to find ways to really communicate with them as to how they're going to believe and how they're going to perform. <laughs> we're we're, we're outperforming ourselves here in the studio today. Um, now the performance level 
if I can bring it back into this room, is tantamount to their perception of how well they're recognized and appreciated. Is that kind of what you were saying earlier? Yeah, I think I think it has a major aspect. And also, I think the comment is to how well they about on their self-esteem as to how much they can really achieve this job. Uh, generally, if a person has a lower self-esteem, they're going to have a much more difficult time in doing things. You're going to have a more difficult time to get them to try new things. Uh, so it's... If and these are all things that the, a manager really needs to be able to observe, think about, and then do something that will mitigate the lesser desired factors. Right. So it's so it's basically you use the word think, which we talked about before. So mm -hmm. it's really a thinking job as to how to work with people. And we're all in the thoughtmosphere. No, you're in the thoughtmosphere. Oh, yes, okay. we're thinking. Okay. Right? So isn't that part of the thoughtmosphere? I guess so. I if never... we're all thinking, then it's, you know, we're all connected. I'm right? learning all these new words, thoughtmosphere and atmosphere and... New well, sphere. New sphere. What new is, sphere. What is that one? Oh, you'll have to look that one up. I we'll, we'll talk about that one next time. First of all, I have a problem. I don't know how to spell these things. So when you say look them up, that becomes very difficult. Oh, well, you know, that, that that's where this the these utensils called pens and paper come in handy. Uh, or now that you've learned how to use your smartphone, I could even text it to you. Oh, okay. That's that's that sounds like a learning experience. It is. And and you know, we're going to have to talk about how to to utilize uh, the technology a little better in the in organizations um, years ago I was part of the um, then American Society for Training and Development it's now the Association for Talent Development and they're all a bunch of um, curriculum developers and instructional designers and things like that to provide learning resources for company employees or corporate employees depending and the trend now is to incorporate all of these new social aspects in smart devices because people are going to be using them anyway, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're dealing with millennials. So the more you can incorporate those in your learning uh, organizational style. Yeah, that's, that's fine if they're apropos for the type of position and activity you're doing. Agreed. And if they're not yeah, apropos, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to do, but then they yeah, want It's not a panacea for everything. Right. Uh, but it does kind of <laughs> allow folks to be more engaged in the ways that they're used to be being engaged. It's kind of like, you know, the, the dictionaries we were talking about earlier, how your listening style is, where you're the kind of things that are, that are comfortable for you. As a manager, you've got to consider what's comfortable for your employees and, and how to reach them where they're at in order to bring them up to the next level of their own performance. Okay. So you, you you went back into teaching style and yes, I agree that the the manager has to really think about the teaching style of the individual. Some people learn visually, some people the, learn... Those are the learning styles. You know, the teaching style ha has to correspond to that right but. so the managerial style has to really correspond to their teaching uh, to their learning style because otherwise the learning is going to be much slower so the skills of the manager are, are much broader and really again goes kind of like to, you in technology that's right that's right me in technology i have the vast experience you uh, do you've got the experience and you hand it off to me to go do it well that's well that's what we call delegation or do you <laughs> want to call it abdication right so it depends on what word you want to depends use. Depends on which throne you're on. That's right. But the key here is is that people have to be thinking about these various aspects in dealing with people. So the again, going back to the manager job, the manager's job is really one of thinking. And people people think that it's always one of doing. And I think our discussion today brought brought the aspects. You have to be a thinker, not a stinker, but a thinker. A stinking thinker. <laughs> No, you don't. You don't want to be a stinking thinker. Speaking of being a stinking thinker, I'm going to throw it back on you for the outtake on this one because I did it earlier okay. and we came back. So you we have a lot of these, all these good things you can get from going to twosmallbizguys.com. That's the number two, and when there are a lot of crib notes of the discussions of books that we discussed on there, and there's also a lot of tools and aids, and you can also find it on 
Now I'm having a practical You're biz. Having a senior you. moment. <laughs> That's right, I'm a senior moment. Practicalbizu.com. So, thanks for listening, and next week we'll have another exciting show. Thank you for listening to Two Small Biz Guys with Zen Benefio and Ray Silverstein. You can hear Two Small Biz Guys live every Wednesday at noon or catch their show on demand anytime 24-7 right here on StarWorldWideNetworks.com.